Hello everyone. Thank you for joining MailChimp's masterclass on paid search. Today, I will be walking you all through some tips and tricks that you can utilize when auditing and evolving your paid search strategies. There will be Q&A in the chat, so feel free to ask questions as we go throughout. I'll also have some live Q&A at the end. Before we get started, I wanna introduce myself though. I'm Terrence Tucker, originally from Indianapolis, Indiana. I now live in Atlanta, Georgia. I've been here for a little over 10 years now. Um, when I first moved here, I started working in marketing at an agency in Buckhead. Now I've been with MailChimp for about four and a half years. Finally, I wanna introduce my quarantine pup. Her name is Nala. She is a golden retriever who just turned one years old. She also hopefully won't be heard today in the background. So what are we talking about today? First off, I'll go through a few glossary terms. There are certain columns that I like to utilize when I'm auditing our paid search performance, and I wanna make sure that you understand what those definitions for those columns are. After that, I will go through some keyword and ad copy recommendations on how you might evaluate that performance. After that, we'll talk about ad extensions, ones that you might be aware of and ones that you might not be. Finally, we'll talk about audience targeting, ways that you can overlay different in-market and affinity audiences to optimize your paid search campaigns. So starting off with the key terminology, first is impression share. So impression share is a column that you can add into your Google reports to help inform how often your ad showed. This is a percent that Google tells you that you had out of the times eligible, you showed X percent of the times. So it's a range between 0% to 100%. 0% means that your ad didn't show at all, and 100% means that your ad showed every time that it was eligible. You will often find yourself somewhere in between 0 to 100% impression share. That's as a result of either a loss in budget or a loss in rank. If you have an impression share loss to budget, which is also a column that you could add into your reporting, this will tell you that on the campaign level, that budget cap is set too low, so you're not spending as much as you could be if you increased it. And by spending more, that oftentimes means stronger results if it's done within campaigns that have strong keywords. You could also find that rank is the issue. So if you're losing impression share to rank, that would mean that either your keyword bids are too low or your quality score needs improvement. And I'll touch on quality score in just a moment. First, I wanna show you what this could look like in your account. So you could find on the campaign level when you add in the impression share column that you have a 35% impression share on your campaign. If that's the case, then you're probably losing impression share to either budget and or rank. In this example, you'll see that 10% of our impression share is lost as a result of our budgets being too low. So what I would look to do there is increase my daily budget cap on the campaign that currently has that issue. For our rank, if we're finding that we're losing, say, 55% of our impression share as a result of our rank, we would then look to either increase our keyword bids or we would look to improve our quality score. And I'll touch on quality score now. This is a metric that Google provides and it's a rating from one to 10. 10 meaning it's perfect, one meaning there's room for improvement. It's made up of three key indicators, one being ad relevance. So this means based on your keyword groups, how tightly themed are they with the ad copy that you're showing? Next would be your expected click-through rate. That means are you using unique benefits, strong call to actions that's resulting in a strong click-through rate for your ads? And finally would be your landing page experience. For the keywords that you're bidding on and the ad copy that you're showing, are you driving to relevant pages on your site? If you're not, you might wanna test other pages that include keywords that are high volume for you, or start testing out things away from the current campaign, or excuse me, the current landing page that you're utilizing. Another factor that you might find that you're losing out on is landing page experience as a result of not having a mobile friendly website. A lot of traffic is driven by mobile devices these days. And as a result, if your page loads slowly, Google will likely ding you for that until you improve it. So with those brief glossary terms, I now wanna talk about how you can look to evaluate your keyword coverage. Within the Google UI, you can see a screen such as this, which is how I tend to filter when I first start looking at keyword performance. On the left-hand side, I navigate to the keyword section and search keywords specifically, which is highlighted in the blue. I then filter for keywords that are enabled you can also include keywords that are either paused or removed if you would like. I personally find much more value only looking at the keywords that are currently live when I'm looking to make optimizations. 
Next, on the right hand side in the upper corner, I've adjusted the date range. Here I'm looking at the last 90 days. For me, that tends to be a sweet spot, so you have relatively recent data and enough data density to make optimizations off of. If you do a shorter time frame, so say 7 or 14 days, there might be some volatility in your performance that kind of skews those results and then you're making optimizations off of maybe what's not the norm for you. On the flip side, if you're looking at a longer time frame, you could find that you have outdated data that isn't really reflective of what's currently happening within your account. So usually for me, 90 days feels like a sweet spot, but it's not necessarily a rule that you always have to go with. You'll also find the columns that I've kind of gone through already in terms of search impression share and quality score as those health check metrics. So here I would add in columns for impression share, impression share loss as a result of my budget, impression share loss as a result of my rank. I would also include my quality score metrics. You can pull in a column to talk about the click-through rate that's expected and if it's average, below average, or above average, as well as the expected click-through rate and the add relevance. So those are all columns that you can add into this view so that you can start analyzing your keyword performance. So once I have my UI how I want it, I will then start to identify what are my top performing keywords. This is gonna be very specific to your business and it's gonna be based off of how you deem your search campaigns to be successful. In my experience, this tends to be either a high number of conversions, a high conversion rate, strong return on ad spend, or a low cost per conversion. So for you, you just need to figure out what's important to your business to justify the dollars that you're putting within paid search and make sure that you're optimizing towards it. So for an example, if I really care about a high conversion rate, I might look and say, well, I don't really know what a benchmark is for my account when it comes to a high conversion rate, so I don't know where to start with what's a top performing keyword. What I tend to do is look at, for that time frame, what is the overall search program's conversion rate? If it's at 10% right now, I would probably identify any keyword above that 10% conversion rate as the success for me having top performing keywords and then figure out how to optimize off of that. If that's too broad and you wanna go a little bit stronger, you could say, okay, what are my top keywords above 10%, but maybe those top 20 or 25 based on their conversion rate. Once I identify my top performing keywords, I then figure out how to optimize it. There's a few different ways that you can do this. I've listed a few examples here for us. One being, maybe I want to increase my campaign budget. So if I've identified the top performing keywords that have really strong conversion rates, and I want to make sure that I'm showing those as frequently as possible, I would go back to the campaigns that those are associated with, and I might determine that I'm losing impression share as a result of my budget being too low. So if I increase my budget for those campaigns, the keywords within those campaigns would show more frequently. You could also find that if you do that, that the keywords that are also underperforming within those campaigns are also eating some of that budget up. So another way that you could go about this is creating separate campaigns for only your top performing keywords. In this instance, I would pause out my keywords that are top performing in the existing campaign, build a second campaign that only houses my top performing keywords, and I would make sure to allow as much budget as possible going to those top performing keywords so that I don't run into the issue of losing impression share as a result of my budget. You can still lose impression share as a result to your budget on your lower performing keywords because those really aren't performing that well for you to begin with, so you really just wanna focus on maxing out what is working right now. After you've done that, another option could be improving your rank. You're potentially having issues with your quality score, so you want to look at your expected click-through rate, your ad relevance, your landing page experience. Are any of those average or below average? If so, you might find that it's worthwhile to do, say, an ad copy test. That way you can improve your expected click-through rate and potentially your ad relevance by having a different variation that performs stronger for you. Another piece of rank is once again the landing page. So if you're finding that your landing page uh, experience is too low, that could be a result of maybe driving to the home page or driving to some category page that's a little bit more general. So I would test out different landing pages that might convert better for me. Finally, search term reports. And I'll touch on this a little bit later as well, but search term reports is something that you're able to look at that tells you what queries triggered your keywords in your ads. So I would look at a search term report to potentially figure out if there are certain keywords that I'm mapping into that I should add into my account. And I'll touch on that a little bit more in a minute. First, I wanna talk about the flip side of this. So if I've already identified the top performing keywords, I might then need to figure out what's underperforming so I can start to trim some fat. 
as a result, you would look at, say, the opposite metric of what you currently did. So if I'm saying 10% is my benchmark for conversion rate and I really care about conversion rate, I would look at what's currently below that 10% threshold and make some optimizations off of that. And once again, if that's too much for you, you can also look at keywords that maybe haven't converted at all but continue to spend money and start making optimizations to start to cut some of that out if it makes sense. So once I've identified those keywords, you could find that improving your rank here as well could help to improve that performance. So meaning if you currently have a keyword that's not converting, not performing well, maybe even has high CPCs, you could find that it's due to a lack of relevance that Google is deeming from your ad copy and your landing page experience. If that's the case, then doing ad copy testing, rotating in new copy could potentially improve that rank and have that keyword show more frequently. And as a result, you could see stronger performance over time. Once again, negative keywords, this goes along with the search term reports that I'll get into in the next slide. A search term report will let you know what you're mapping into with the keywords that you're bidding on. So if there are certain keywords that you're mapping in on, you could add them as negatives if it makes sense so that you don't show for those anymore and that will cut out anything that's not performing well for you. You could also look to adjust your match types. So Google allows you to bid on either exact phrase or broad match types. Exact match means it's pretty much exactly whatever you have as your keyword is what you're going to show for. Phrase match means it's maybe not exactly what you're, you're bidding on from a keyword perspective, but it's a close variant enough that it's going to trigger it because it has some different modifiers in there. And then broad will be a little bit wider reaching, a little less refined, and as a result, that could result in some underperforming keywords as well. So if you're finding that you have a lot of underperforming keywords and potentially they're all broad match, you might look to pause those broad match keywords and focus your efforts right now on exact and phrase match. Next is pause and remove, which kind of touches on that last point. If you find that there are keywords that you have either exact phrase or broad match that just aren't performing well for you no matter what you do from adjustments on your ad copy to your landing page, you might just look to pause those keywords so that you're no longer spending money on areas that aren't performing well for you and instead continue your efforts on what is top performing. Search term reports. So this is what I keep referencing. On the left hand side, you'll see that we've moved away from the search keywords to the search terms section of Google Ads. So this is once again the Google Ads UI and that's where we're filtered for. I also add a filter for added excluded equals none. So what that means is that I don't want to see any search terms that I've added to the account or excluded from the account. Instead, I only want to see search terms that I haven't done anything with yet. The reason being similar to the status wanting to be enabled for our keywords, I don't necessarily need to make any optimizations off of anything that I've already excluded or added to the account. Instead, I want to focus on those keywords that I haven't done anything to yet. So once I filter for that, I then look to see what irrelevant keywords I might be mapping into tend to search oftentimes by impression volume and cost at first, just to see where most of my impressions are coming from, where most of my cost is going, and from there deciding if there are things that I'm mapping into that just really aren't performing well for me, either based on, once again, that conversion metric, potentially a high CPC, or just does not fit with the brand that I have and doesn't seem like something I wanna show and add for any more in the future. Then you could also look at those high volume, high converting terms. So as I said with the top performing keywords, you might find that you're mapping in on phrase or broad match for certain search terms that are actually performing really well for you. If that's the case, you can look to add them into your account and that way you can start actively bidding on them and making sure that you have a good presence for them. I would also use caution. So you'll find that there are a lot of unique long tail keywords that have low search volume that you're mapping into. Some of them might convert, but probably not that often. As a result, I tend to keep those in the account, but I don't necessarily add them or exclude them. The reason being is that it's low search volume, so after a while it's possible that this no longer triggers an ad, and I don't feel it's necessary at that moment to add it into the account until I start to see search volume start to pick up. One more thing I wanna add, I have a column here called keyword. I'm not sure if you can see it, but essentially here, I'm manually adding in the keyword column, which helps to tell me which keyword that I'm actively bidding on is mapping into which search term that the user's actually searching on the Google results page. I always recommend adding in keyword even though they don't do it by default because it helps you understand where you might have a mapping issue. 
Next, I want to touch on keyword statuses. Also might not be able to see this too much, but that's okay, I'll walk you through it. Essentially here you have a filter for eligible, limited, and disapproved status. So when I go into my filters within Google Ads, I figure out what keywords are currently having these status issues that I might need to take some action on. A few of the things that you might see would be below first page bid. What this is telling us is that Google is saying this is a very competitive term and for us to show above the first page and more frequently, we will need, need to increase how much we're willing to pay per click in order to do that. Based on your business and how comfortable you are with CPCs, I would recommend this if it makes sense to pay a little bit more of a premium for that click if it converts well for you. You might also see low search volume, and this touches back on that search term report. If you're finding that you have keywords that you're bidding on right now that have low search volume, I tend to look to pause them and identify maybe a broader keyword or a different match type that I might wanna bid on. Once again, low search volume keywords don't trigger ads that often, and I don't necessarily find that much volume on bidding on those when I can focus on things that actually drive results. Next would be low quality scores. So if you're finding that there are keywords that currently have a low quality score, I would identify either the ad relevance or the landing page or the expected click through rate as the issue. And then I would look how to resolve that. The great thing about low quality scores is that it doesn't cost you that much more to change anything, unless it may be from the landing page perspective, you have to hire somebody to help you out with that. But other than that, you definitely have a little bit more control over creating some new headlines and new descriptions to quickly solve that low quality score. So that one seems like a lower barrier in terms of the cost that you would have to pay for it. I also want to add that sometimes you absolutely do nothing. So there are different verticals, whether it be finance or healthcare, that you do find that you get an eligible limited status, and that's just a result of the vertical that you're in. So sometimes you don't have the control to make any adjustments. If you're seeing any of these issues though, I definitely recommend reaching out to Google support if you need more insights. They can help you troubleshoot and figure out how to resolve it. Next, I want to touch on the Google Keyword Planner. This is a great tool, especially if you haven't already started your paid search campaigns, to identify what keywords you should be bidding on based on what you uh, have to sell. So the first side on the, the left is Discover New Keywords. There you'll upload, say, 10 or so keywords in the Google Keyword Planner, and Google will let you know what similar keywords you might want to bid on based on how people are searching. On the right side, is the Google search volume and forecast. So once you have your keywords, you can upload them to Google and they'll let you know what they forecast out, the spin to be, the clicks, the click-through rate, etc. That's a great way to start figuring out what budget you might need for your paid search campaigns. I will caveat that this is directional at best for me and my use. I have used it quite a bit over time and I do find it helpful just to understand from a competition perspective and a search volume perspective what makes sense to add into the account, but sometimes those estimates can be a little bit off, so I would say take it with a grain of salt. Next, I wanted to highlight Google Trends. So if you go to google.com slash trends, this is a great way to understand seasonality over time for different topics. That can be the products that you sell, different businesses. You could even do celebrities or sports if you're interested. Here you can do those searches to identify when is there really peak searches for that topic. On the left-hand side, I have it for candles. So Google is telling me that there are some peaks in candle searches around the December timeframe. And with that information, I might look to flight my budget a little bit more heavily during that timeframe to make sure that I'm not losing impression share as a result of having too low budget. On the right hand side, I'm just searching for Black Friday, Cyber Monday, just really interested to figure out when those peak seasons start to take up in Google search. As a result, once again, if I have something that is seasonal that I do wanna push during that time frame, I might look to increase my budget a little bit during when that starts to rise. I'll also note that this is currently filtered for the US, but you can look in other countries if that is something that you are interested in. Finally, for keywords, I wanted to talk about holiday queries. So you could add in holiday queries to your account if it makes sense. I will say I'm hesitant to fully recommend it because these do tend to be highly competitive and expensive at times. So you could find that you're bidding on keywords that a lot of competitors or even people that aren't your direct competitor are also bidding on and mapping into. I also keep mentioning relevancy. That's a, a pretty key topic when it comes to Google Ads. So with these searches, you probably don't have a landing page or ad copy right now that fits into these. So I'd be really smart around how I can maybe adjust my current approach for the holiday season to cover this. Finally, I'll add, 
As I talked about candles being a search that kind of pops up around December, if I wanted to make this a little bit more qualified, I could do say Christmas candle gifts so that I have a qualifier in there that keeps that relevancy a little bit closer with the product that I offer, my ad copy, and my landing page. With that, we'll move over to ad copy. So here we're back in the Google UI and I'm looking to filter out for my poor performing keywords based on ad strength. Ad strength is a column that you can add in. And then I'm also looking at the recommendations that Google provides based on those poor ad strengths. This is a great way for Google to direct you on how you can solve the issues that are happening within your current ad copy. I tend to filter for poor just because I like to see where I'm currently bleeding so I can take quick action. If you want to look at all of your ad copy, you're more than welcome to do that as well, but I definitely recommend figuring out where you can maybe start from and then work your way back. So once we've identified the ad copy that's not performing well for us, I would then do a search for the top performing keywords that I have. So anything with a high impression volume, start searching for those keywords and see what competitors show up on that results page. Once I do that, I'll look and figure out, okay, what ad copy do they have? What extensions do they have? And I'll make some decisions. The first one being I'm searching for white pillow, which might be a high volume keyword for me. And I'm noticing that none of the ads that are currently shown mention white pillow at all. As a result, I would like to add in copy to my account that says white pillow in it to keep that relevance even tighter than my competitors. You'll also notice that there are a couple of ads towards the bottom for linen sheets and furniture for apartments. For me, that would tell me that there's a mapping issue and that's not relevant to me, so that's a waste. I would check your account to make sure that the ad copy that you have matches with the keywords and the ad group that they're in so that you don't run into that issue. Next, I would identify the relevant extensions that they're currently utilizing. So I can see on that first ad, we're utilizing site links, which are those blue text below the black text. Uh, and then after that, we're seeing a location extension for other locations in Atlanta for that business. Those are great extensions that you can also utilize if it makes sense for your business. So for example, that location extension, if you have a brick and mortar, that might be something that you also wanna take advantage of. And I'll talk about extensions in a little bit later. Next, I would say fill the void. If there's any unique selling propositions that you have to offer for your business, I would make sure to include that in your copy. The first ad does a great job of this by talking about free and fast shipping, returns, five-star reviews, et cetera. If there's anything along those lines that you also have to offer that makes your business seem more competitive, I would make sure to highlight that as often as possible within your ad copy. Finally, I would look at pricing and promos. So you do see that first ad has up to 20% off, which is great. The third ad down has uh, try at home for free. So that would be telling me, okay, is there anything like this that I have that I can offer to put some price point in there to make it seem more competitive, especially if it's a promo. This is another good use case. So adding urgency into your copy, this is what's called a countdown and you can add it into your headlines or your descriptions. And essentially what this does is let Google dynamically count down the days before your promo ends. So if you go into your, uh, your ad settings and you go and put countdown in the Santex, it will start to populate the form on the left-hand side. From there, you can say what day your promo is going to end and Google will start to count that down and you can set it for either the time of your business or the time that the user is on for it to end. A couple of other recommendations for ad copy that I want to make sure to highlight is one using responsive ads. So responsive search ads is becoming the default ad for Google. The expanded text ads has been in the past, but those will be sunset come June 30th of next year. As a result, you should be working to make sure all of your ad groups have responsive ads in it so that you don't run into that issue come June of next year. Next would be using more unique headlines and descriptions as possible. This is great because it allows Google to mix and match your responsive search ads to show in different variations based off of the user's query. Next, I would include your brand name. So your brand might not be well known right now, or it might be, regardless of if it is or it isn't, I would add your brand name in there to start building some brand recognition for you. I would also look to increase the high volume keywords that I have in my ad copy. Relevance is the name of the game here, so whatever high volume keywords that you're bidding on, you wanna make sure that when your ad is triggered, there's a clear association between the two. 
The good news for responsive ads, you might not be able to see it in the screenshot to the right, but it does give you recommendations on top volume keywords that you currently have that you might want to add into your ad copy. You can't see it, but it's on the right hand side and there's blue text that they uh, prompt you with to view what your top performing keywords are. Next, we have to add a, a clear call to action. So I want to make sure that the call to action that I'm utilizing in my ad copy is driving people to the landing page that gives them that action to take. So just making sure that that association between the two is clear. I also want to do clear USPs or unique selling propositions. So as I talked about in the last slide, if I have same day delivery, if I have free shipping, lifetime warranty, whatever my offer might be that I want to make sure makes my business stand out from the competitor, I want to highlight here. Finally, I would maintain consistent capitalization. This one probably isn't talked about as much, but it can definitely look a little bit spammy or fishy if you have different cases within your ad copy. So maintaining consistency here is key. We will now move over to ad extensions. So I do want to highlight some ad extensions that might make sense for you and your business, but first I want to let you know what ad extensions are. This is essentially an expansion of your ad that allows people to either learn more about you in unclickable text or allows you to have more clickable text driving to other places on your site. There's a list on the left hand side of different ad extensions that you might find in your account. I will note that not all advertisers have all extensions. There are sometimes thresholds that Google makes you go through before you actually can do all of these extensions. The good news about uh, extensions is that it helps improve your quality score and your expected click-through rate. So as we talk about ad rank being a factor for why you might be losing impression share, if you add extensions, you're likely to see an increase in that click-through rate as well as an improvement in your quality score. So touching on a few extensions here, one of which being the site links, I would say that this is probably the most commonly used. I would highly recommend for any business to have at least four site links that you currently have live. I would also include descriptions. I've found many advertisers trying to skimp on the descriptions because they want to get it out the door. So having just headlines uh, is enough and you can definitely go line with just live with just headlines, which is that blue clickable text. Um, but the descriptions below it help to build out, out your ad to take up more real estate on the results page. On the right side, you have call out and structured snippets. So these are examples of non-clickable text, but it does provide additional information around your business. So here you can highlight the different offerings that you have or different features of your business that might make you unique. These extensions might not be relevant for all businesses, but I wanna make sure that people are aware of them. One is the promotion extension. So if you have say a sale that you wanna do on Black Friday, you can go into Google and in your, the extension section, you can add in a promo and include a code if you would like on what that is and it will live uh, separately right below your text ad. I touched on location extension already. If you have a Google My Business in a brick and mortar store, this could be a way, great way to drive foot traffic. So I would highly recommend doing that if it makes sense for you. At the bottom, we have the price extension. So this is a great way if you have different packages or plans that you wanna highlight, you can add multiple here and let the consumer know what you have to offer and how much it is so they can start self-qualifying if it makes sense for them. Finally, on the right, we have image extensions. This is an additional image that you can put on your text ad. It's not exactly a shopping ad, but it lets you at least have an image of maybe your product or your brand that can help highlight and drive some relevancy in terms of what you have to offer. With that, we'll move over to audience targeting. So with audience targeting, this is a great way to make optimizations within your paid search campaigns. It's often thought of for Facebook ads or for display ads, but you can actually apply audiences to your Google search ads to make adjustments. There's two ways you can do this. One of which would be targeting, and that means that every time somebody who falls into your audiences and searches for your keywords does that, then you show an ad. The other side would be observation. This means that you're, you have audiences applied to your account, but you also have keywords that you're bidding on. So people that fit in those audiences would see your ad, but then also people that fall outside of those audiences would see your ad. Observation is what Google recommends here as well as I do. That's because it doesn't limit your reach. You still can reach prospecting people that don't fall within these audiences, but you can use that audience information to make adjustments on the audiences that are performing well for you. If you don't know where to begin with audiences, one way would be to use the Google Ads Pixel for your site. Google lets you know, based on that data insights, what, in, uh, what audiences you're over indexing for and you can start to layer on some of those audiences onto your ads so that you're able to either increase or decrease your uh, bids based on the performance for those audiences. 
You could also look to overlay remarketing audiences if you have those available or customer match audiences if you have those available uh, as an additional optimization lever. And with that, we'll go to the recap. I wanna highlight five key takeaways that I hope that you all got out of this today. One about which being reviewing your account's impression share. The impression share, the impression share loss to rank, and the impression share loss to budget are great key indicators on how the health of your account is. If you're able to decrease the impression share loss as a result of your budget being too low, your keyword bids being too low, or your quality score being too poor, you'll start to see improvements in your performance as you adjust. Next would be using the search term reports to figuring out which keywords it makes sense to either add or negate into your account. This is a great optimization lever to ensure that you're not showing up for irrelevant queries, but that you also have control over the ones that do work well that you're mapping into. Third would be looking for keyword expansion opportunities and seasonality. As I talked about flighting your budget, you wanna make sure that you're not losing impression share as a result of budget, especially when you're in a peak season for what you have to offer. So adjusting your budget accordingly makes a lot of sense here. The fourth one being increase relevance in your ads and your landing page. Relevance is truly the name of the game when it comes to the Google algorithm. The more you can maintain relevancy between your ads, your keywords, and your landing page, the better you'll be. Finally, don't skimp on ad extensions and apply audiences. Ad extensions are a great way to beef up your ads, to take up more real estate on the search results page, and provide the customer with more information to choose your business. Applying audiences are also a great way to adjust performance based on the what's happening with them and in either increasing or decreasing that bid modifier if they're performing well for you. And with that, we'll begin the live q and I'll throw it over to Amy, who's going to help build questions today. Amy? Thanks, Terrence. Hi, everyone. All right, question one. How soon should you begin? I'm sorry. Okay. Um, do you need a large budget for paid search to be effective? It's a great question. Um, it is, to a certain degree, a numbers game, but you don't need a large budget, which I know is a relative term. I've done with advertisers who have as low as say a thousand to two thousand dollars a month to spend on paid search. Um, it's definitely going to be harder to get that data density that I talked about in the earlier slides to start making optimizations off of because you don't have that much daily spend that you're spending towards. So it's definitely helpful to have a larger spend so that you're showing more frequently. I'll also say that competition is a big factor here. So if you have a very competitive category, very competitive keywords, you'll have to pay a little bit more of a premium for that CPC. So you'll need to make sure that your budget can withstand how high those CPCs might be. But I wouldn't say you need a large budget. I would just say, well, I guess I should say that's relative based on your business. But I would say you probably need at least a couple of thousand dollars to really start to make an impact. Great. Uh, so Terrence, do you have any tips for tracking paid search success for brick and mortar businesses? Yeah, I do actually. So there's uh, what's called store visits. You can definitely find a Google help article on it. But what that does is help to indicate people that interacted with your ad and then they were logged into their Google devices and ha are sharing their location. And Google can track that when they go into your brick and mortar location and count that as a visit within your paid search columns. So I would check out store visits within Google as a way to track that brick and mortar location. All right. Um, my account was suspended by Google Ads. They said I violated their ad policy randomly out of the blue. Any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, it could be a few different factors here. Um, if your ad hasn't shown or triggered at all, I would take a look and figure out maybe there's a policy violation. Um, if you possibly have uh, ads related to a special category, so as I mentioned previously, finance, um, healthcare, these different verticals that just have hyper discrimination, Google wants to be on the right side of that. So they try to limit and adjust as possible to make sure that they're within compliance. Um, so it could potentially be that if that's one of the verticals that you're in, I would recommend probably reaching out to Google support. So if you're in the UI, go into the top right corner, there's like a little wheel there. I would go and talk to somebody from the support team and they should be able to provide answers as to why your specific account was uh, disapproved. Perfect. Uh, Terrence, please address strategies for tiny but growing solopreneur, solopreneur businesses where both time and resources are at a premium. 
Sure, yeah, it's, it's not easy. I will say that there is a lot of optimizations that need to be made, especially if you have a lower budget so that you're not wasting dollars on irrelevant uh, clicks that aren't actually driving results. Um, one way you could do that is possibly by launching a smart campaign. So what I talked about today was just more so the traditional campaigns where you're in there making optimizations on a daily or weekly basis, but they do have what's called smart campaigns as well. So this is a little bit more of an automated approach for smaller businesses so they don't have to think as much about what's happening within their search campaigns. So I would recommend looking into that as a potential solution. Great. How does Google measure landing page experience? It's a great question. Um, so there's a few factors, and I'll, I'll also add that with the quality score, I mentioned the three factors that go into that. So that's expected click-through rate, landing page experience, and ad relevance. Those are the three columns and insights that Google gives us, but there's definitely other factors out there that aren't necessarily reported back to us. So those are just the three that we have insight into. When it comes to your landing page experience, you'll get a rating of either average, above average, or below average. If you are at average or below average, I would take a look at your current experience between your ads that you have showing, the keywords that you're bidding on, and the landing page that you're driving to. Those top volume keywords within that ad group, are is that also on the landing page that you're driving traffic to? If not, you could be getting dinged by Google as a result of not having that alignment and that relevance there. Um, so that's one way. Another way, as I talked about, was the, um, the load speed. So a lot of traffic coming on mobile devices, Google wants to make sure that the experience for the consumer is the best as possible. As a result, if you have a lower loading site, that could also be an issue for you and why you might have a lower rating there. Perfect, okay, we have time for a few more. Let's see, what is a good standard time period to test the success of a keyword? For example, should I let it run one week versus one month, more, less? Yeah, that's gonna be contingent on your budget for sure um, and the competition for that keyword. I would say I would probably give it, if it's a newer keyword, at least two weeks to run. The reason being is when you launch a new campaign especially, you go through what's called a learning phase. So your campaigns will be in a learning phase for five days and it's gonna have some volatility during those five days. So I would wanna make sure that it's outside of the learning phase before I start making optimizations off of the keywords within that campaign. So I would say roughly 14 days would be good. If you could wait a little bit longer, maybe even 30, that would be ideal. Great. What are your top recommendations for paid ads other than Google? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, it depends on success metrics. That's a lot of depends here, I know, uh, but I, I want to make sure to be clear that not everything is a one size fits all. Um, so if search is working well for you, you can look to explore on Bing ads. So Google probably has around 80 to 90% of the market share for search ads, but Bing is a good supplement to that. Um, you can essentially import your Google ads to Bing and start showing on places like Bing, AOL, and Yahoo. Um, so that could be another way to supplement if search is performing well for you. I also find that it has lower competition, so you might find cheaper CPCs there. Um, outside of that, you could look to launch a display campaign. I would highly recommend this if you don't already have it for remarketing purposes. You could also look at prospecting. So remarketing essentially means people that have visited your site, if you have the Google Pixel on your site, you could remarket to those people if they've visited your site within the last, say, 30, 60, 90 days. Um, you could do prospecting, which would be overlaying some of those in-market audiences and reaching people that have never been to your site to get them enticed with your brand. Um, so that could be another supplement as well. And then I you know Facebook is the big gorilla in the market, so Facebook, Instagram ads could be well for you as well, depending on what your brand is. Okay, uh, Google Shopping. I'm selling a physical product. Should I focus on Google Shopping instead of search ads? It's a great question. Um, so I didn't get to touch on, on shopping just because of the time here, but shopping is a super vital thing that I would recommend anybody that's an e-commerce to look into. It is gonna be a bit more of a barrier to get into um, just because you do have to have a shopping feed and a Google Merchant account in order to get live with that. So it's a little bit more of a lift. So if, if you don't have the time, that might not be right for you. Um, in terms of between Google Shopping and search, which one would you uh, prefer over the other? 
I do find that shopping did have lower CPCs when I was using it um, compared to Google search ads just because there was less competition in shopping than there is for text ads. So from a CPC perspective, it was better for me to have that live, but I always find it to be a great compliment. So you'll see in the Google results page that there are oftentimes shopping uh, linkings above and then a few text ads right below that. So they are a great complement to one another. So if you can do both, I would recommend both. If you only have one to do, I find that shopping performs well if I'm worried about CPCs, but overall paid search in the text ad realm, that tends to be what's king for me. All right, last question. You're doing great, Terrence. <laughs> How many keywords should you start out with? Is there an issue if you have too few or too many? I honestly, I, I try to over index more. Uh, so if I if I can have more live at the launch, I tend to do that. The reason being is you maybe have gone through the keyword planner, you've started to look for keywords that it makes sense to bid on, but you don't really know what's really gonna happen in that ecosystem until you actually go live with your campaigns. So I find going live with more keywords at the start makes sense for me. Um, based on your budget, based on what you're comfortable with, you might not have that same exact experience. If that's the case, I might look at match types. So I talked about there being exact phrase and broad match types. Uh, exact will be the best one for anybody that's a little bit cautious stepping into search because it's basically saying this is the exact keyword that I want to bid on and I want to match with any search term that is basically exactly what I'm bidding on and not super broad and mapping into other things. So I would recommend definitely looking at exact match keywords and maybe buffing it out quite a bit at launch and then start to use some of those optimization levers to pull back in areas that you don't find strong performance. If there's keywords with low volume, potentially pause those. If there's keywords that have poor quality score and you don't have time to fix those, potentially pause those. Figure out what those top performing keywords are and keep those live. Okay, that's all the time we have for Q&A today. That was super helpful, Terrence. Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you. I appreciate it. Cool, and thank you all for joining me today. I hope that you all were able to learn something and take it away to apply to your future campaigns. Um, I also do wanna mention that there are other master classes this week, so if you're interested, you can definitely go online to register. I believe there's probably a link in the chat. Um, those different classes would be figuring out how to increase your sales with integrations, how to utilize automations within email, as well as learning how to utilize Google Analytics to boost sales. So I highly recommend checking those out. Once again, thank you all for joining me today. I really do appreciate it. I hope you all have a great rest of your day. Bye.